thine heart and tie them about thy neck. Proverbs 23:24. The father of the righteous child has great joy. Man who fathers a wise son re rejoices in him. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. 
Beautiful day outside. Happy Father's Day to all of our fathers. We've got a great assembly here this morning, and I'm excited about being able to continue our sermon series today. So hopefully that'll be a very encouraging message. But first, we want to make sure that you are welcomed into the service. And as a part of that, just a general reminder, if you'd like to take part of the communion, which will follow later in the service, make sure that you've grabbed one of these little communion kits, which are throughout the assembly area here on the tables, and that will allow you to keep that in readiness for the uh, communion time a little bit later on. So keep that in uh, kind of arm's reach, and that way you'll be prepared. Uh, we do have a couple things that we want to make sure are uh, reminded of um, this morning, uh, and I'm going to just encourage you, I'm not going to take a lot of time, just encourage you to go to our website and log in there to help us know with the uh, attendance. But for tonight, we want to make sure that you know because of Father's Day, we will not be offering any programs this evening. There will not be any youth uh, activities, and there will not be any uh, adult Bible study tonight either. So we're encouraging you to make sure uh, that you remember that. Uh, also, I want to remind our fellows, all of our men are um, going to be receiving a gift this morning. Uh, this is the chicken Sunday, so Chick-fil-A uh, is available for you, Chick-fil-A cards. So we want to make sure that you pick those up as you leave this morning morning and uh, take our, our thanks for being here in service with us. Next week, we're planning on resuming again normal uh, kind of ordinary uh, service in terms of our uh, youth programs, our Sunday evening programs and everything, but at least for tonight, you'll know uh, no services. We do have some prayer requests uh, also that I want to uh, share with you, and before I get ahead of myself, uh, also the Mark Bishop concert July the 10th. Um, I, I, you all can read, so I'll just wait for a moment. <laughs> um, I'm just here reading. So uh, July the 10th, that is uh, coming up really quickly, is our Mark Bishop concert. Please make plans to be here if possible. That's at 6 o'clock and look forward to having an opportunity to be in concert with Mark again. And invite guests. There is no cost, no ticket. Um, it's just a free will offering, so we're encouraging you to be here to be a part of that. All right, we do have prayer requests that I'd like to share uh, with you this morning. In addition to uh, requests that we have had over the last few weeks, we've had some additions that have been made. And I don't know why this does this to me, Scott. It keeps you on your toes. Scott's on it. Uh, we do have some additions that need to be made. First of all, I had mentioned um, the uh, request quite a long time ago with regard to Dr. Cottrell. Uh, Dr. Cottrell had an exploratory surgery just earlier this month. They have determined that they can do no more for him. And uh, he is, by best estimation, they have said probably two months uh, in terms of expectation. Uh, Dr. Cockrell is a wonderful, uh, wonderful scholar in our brotherhood and certainly appreciates the continued ongoing prayer support there. So please continue to pray for he and his family as they work their way through this process. I want to also encourage you to continue to pray for David Shoptaw. David has been um, dealing with um, kind of uh, a prolonged period of, of decline and it's been a very difficult, discouraging thing for the family. Family as well. So please pray for David and for his family. This um, is um, connected to the church through the Thomases. So we want to continue to pray for David and for his family also. Uh, some requests that have been added in addition uh, through this past week. I want to pray for Ann King. Uh, this is Mel Bland's mother. I want to pray for, uh, as, as uh, we have been remembering, the Ganan family as well as the Sippel family in their time of loss uh, over the last couple of weeks, the Mike Friend family, and also the Jimmy Lynch family as well. Tremendous amount of, of need there. Uh, what I would like to do um, also, in addition, uh, is to make sure that we remember to mention Andrea, who is...
is uh, Andre Newman, who is going in for her procedure tomorrow, and also Erlene Thomas, who is going in for her procedure on Wednesday. So uh, please remember to pray for them in a special way, and I'm confident that they will greatly appreciate that. And uh, we'll we'll have a, a special opportunity of prayer for them uh, right before the message as well. So a great deal of things that are going on, and uh, I want to encourage you to make sure that you're taking note of each of the things that are pertinent to you, and that you are in active prayer for each of these requests as well. All right, we have uh, scripture reading, and then we will have our time of uh, prayer and beginning into our service. This morning comes from Matthew 6, uh, 6 uh, verses 19 and following. It says, Do not store up yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor dust destroys, and where thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. Uh, pray with me. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day, for the opportunity we had to gather here together as believers to worship you and to learn from your truth. We uh, pray a special blessing in the men of our church and the fathers, uh, that we may be uh, living in accordance with your will. We pray for our worship service, that uh, uh, we may learn something from, this, from your word, and that we may apply it to our lives and take it with us, that we may be light in this world. Uh, we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Jared. As we continue on this morning, we come to our song service, and our first hymn this morning is You, my, you Are My All in All. As we continue on this morning, we come to our second hymn. Our second hymn is Great is Thy Faithfulness.
right. Thank you, Jake. Thank you, Sally. Appreciate that. All right. I'm running on about that much sleep. So not enough caffeine, not enough sleep. Rita and I pull out to go to South Dakota on Wednesday, hopefully. This will be the first time in 32 years all of my siblings will be together, you know, with parole and that kind of stuff. Makes it kind of tricky. <laughs> Last time we were together was 11 years ago, so uh, mom is, is pretty excited about this. We are very excited, but we are burning both ends of the candle as hard as we can. So if I fall asleep during the sermon today, just close the door and go out quietly and it'll all be okay. All right, before we get into the message today, let's take just a moment, let's have a word of prayer, and I'm going to also just ask, if you would, to uh, remember for Erlene and for Andrea as well, and we'll offer a special prayer for them, and then we'll get into our message for today. So let's pray together. Father, thank you for hearing our prayers. You know, we come to this day and we think about fathers, and sometimes the only reference that we have really uh, to consider you and our relationship to you is our earthly father. Sometimes that's a great reference, and sometimes it's, it's kind of confusing or perhaps painful or maybe not the best example. We're thankful for the consistency with which you show yourself as a father. And we aspire as godly men to be able to show those same character traits, those same attributes. Whether we are fathers or not, we want to be godly men. And so our prayer, Lord, is that you'd help us to learn from the example you've given us. Help us to be able to see the consistency with which you love and pour your grace out upon us. Help us to recognize your righteousness and your justice and to do so meted out with love. We pray that you would help us to pay attention to the, the life Jesus lived so that our service can mirror his and be able to show a life of faithfulness. Thank you, Father, for being concerned enough for us that you allow us an opportunity to be a part of your family, part of the church, and to enjoy the opportunity to interact with one another and to be encouraged and strengthened and built up in our faith because of your word. This morning, Lord, we come also with concern, praying that you would watch over the circumstances that are, are facing now for Andrea and also for Erlene as they both approach surgery. We know that in both of these circumstances, um, certainly there are unknowns in terms of, of what the doctors will be doing, and they have a, a good idea, but often don't know until the procedure. And so we pray that you would provide a sense of assurance and calm, a sense of peace. We pray that you would guide the hands of the surgeons who will be working to provide care for both circumstances. We pray for healing and an opportunity for recovery. And Father, I pray especially that this would be an opportunity for others to recognize your answered prayer and to be able to see the sufficiency of your provision. I pray, Father, that you would continue to provide a sense of peace and assurance for both Andrea and for Erlene as they approach this, that they'd not be anxious or nervous, and that you do the best um, that, that's possible for them, and that would be evident. Lord, thank you again for hearing our prayers. May you surround these and others who are in need with the hope and the assurance that comes from knowing Christ, and we pray in the name of Jesus, amen. All right, we're going to go back to Luke chapter 15 today. We're on the third of four messages where we're dealing with the idea of lost items or actually what we're talking about is God's expression of love and his grace toward us. But I want to remind you from Luke 15, the first couple verses there, of what really has set the tone for what we're about to go into today. Luke chapter 15, verses 1 and 2, the scripture says, Now all the tax collectors and the the sinners were coming near to him to listen to him. Both the Pharisees and the scribes began to grumble, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. Now, I think it's rather interesting on a couple of points. First of all, the scripture identifies that tax collectors and sinners, large groups, in fact, it uses that phrase, all of the tax collectors and all of the sinners were coming out to hear him. And then in the very next sentence, it throws out both the Pharisees and the scribes were saying they were offering a criticism. So you have two different groups that are here. You have those who are 
perhaps acknowledging their sinfulness. They're acknowledging their need to be in the presence of Jesus and to hear about what God has provided as an answer to their sin. And then you have the other subset of this group. We don't know exactly how large an expression of this group was. Perhaps it was a majority. Maybe it was a smaller group. We don't really know. But we know that they are considering themselves to not be a part of the first group. And remember, the scripture says very pointedly, the first group was tax collectors and sinners. So not liked and not spiritual. And the second group, the scribes and Pharisees, well, they think they're above this. They're not a part of the common masses. And as such, they're offering criticism. From their perspective, Jesus is doing something wrong because he has in his audience people who are sinful. And this begs the question, where could Jesus go where sinners would not gather? <laughs> Where could Jesus go and speak and have someone hear him who was not a sinner? With whom could Jesus interact who had not already committed sin or was perhaps even engaged currently in sin and didn't realize their need for change? And then there comes kind of the self-examination aspect of this. If I were going to be in this crowd hearing Jesus... Would I have been more prone to fall in line with the cynics or the criticisms of the Pharisees and the scribes, thinking myself above the others? Or would I have been more contrite, more in a position of humility to recognize my ongoing condition in need of forgiveness? Now this is what sets the tone then for the stories we've heard up to this point. So let's take just a moment and let's see kind of the, the course we've followed up to this point. First of all, the phrasing sinners and tax collectors really just kind of fits us all. <laughs> because we're all either one or the other. And we're definitely the first. We may not be actively engaged in collecting taxes or as kind of what happened in that point uh, in history, kind of extorting. Um, but we are sinful. We are sinners. So there is that context, and we need to know that at the very beginning. Secondly, we also need to know of the two accounts we've already covered, there's something being told to us regarding God's concern for our need, His ability to meet that need, and what we call that, which is grace. There are two paths by which we can go. In our lost condition as sinners, we can either choose to follow the course of our own self-righteousness and goodness, or we can appeal through our obedience and submission and faith to Christ's goodness and receive His grace. The first account we talked about was the lost lamb, and we examined the reality that even though that one out of the hundred, that one lamb was lost, wandered away, and needed to be found, it was still owned by the shepherd. It was still loved and found to be precious by the shepherd, such that he left the remaining flock and went and looked for that lamb in order to restore Secondly, we talked about the coin last week and one of ten, something very precious, something that would have had some sentiment as well as some actual financial value to the woman who lost the coin. There was a sense of social dignity that had been impaired by her losing it, a sense of insecurity. She was anxious about it. And the Bible says she was very engaged in trying to find that coin. That coin was of value it was lost, but it was still in the house. I say this because, as I've mentioned already in the very first message, we talked about John's writing in 1 John. And one of the texts that's used so often in terms of forgiveness comes from 1 John. And it's the idea of, of repenting of sin. And the problem is, often it's misapplied. It's often applied in a way that is like a checklist that we have to keep track of and we have to ask God's specific forgiveness for every specific sin we've committed. 
And this comes from a lot of different influencing areas in terms of religious teaching, but it's not the correct understanding. The understanding of that text from 1 John is that we should, in an ongoing idea of repentance, be familiar with the idea, be sincere with understanding, and openly state, we are always ongoing in need of forgiveness. That's where we are. Now the sufficiency of the blood of Christ is such that He is able through His sacrifice to forgive and cleanse us of our sin, both the sins we'd committed up to the time of becoming a Christian and everything from that point forward. That's the wonder, the power of the blood that we sing about. That being said, I want to ask the question, of the two courses offered to you today, which would you rather pursue? The course of the law, for lack of kind of a better term, the one that's dependent upon our own self-goodness and acts of work, or would we rather rely upon cooperating with God's terms and receiving His benefit of grace? Well, Paul goes into great detail talking about this in a number of his epistles, his letters that he wrote. And he talks about the overwhelming benefit of grace as compared to the metric of following the law. And I hope that you can see the difference there. Let's take a little while. Let's walk through an account that's very familiar for most, referred to as the prodigal son. And this text is interesting because it discusses two sons, actually, not just one, and their relationship with their father. And it often uses the phrase prodigal. Now, I want to make sure that we all understand prodigal isn't in reference to him being lost. The, the idea of being a prodigal is that he's wasteful. He's extravagant. He's done what he shouldn't do, okay? He's, he's not been responsible. In Luke chapter 15, and I'm going to break this text up because it's rather long, but beginning in Luke 15, verses 11 through 13, we're going to read kind of the beginning stages of this account. And it said, A man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate that falls to me. So he divided his wealth between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered everything together and went on a journey into a distant country, and there he squandered his estate with loose living. Now, a couple things that point here. I think it's interesting often, the, the idea is that the older is more mature, more level-headed, and, and responsible, and the younger, not so much. In this particular case, there's perhaps a reason why the older and the younger are kind of positioned the way they are. If you're thinking about it in terms of eras or times, if you consider the older son to be representative of a time of the law and the newer son to be representative of a time of grace, it kind of sets a little bit of a tone here. Secondly, I want to make sure that we understand the request the son made was outside the social norm, but the father didn't condemn it. He instead cooperated with it. And he did not just give a portion to the young son and say to the young son, go off and do what you're going to do. The Bible says... He divided the estate and gave both of the sons what was coming to them. The older of the two sons stayed behind. The younger of the two sons, the Bible said, packed up everything that he had, went to a distant land, and then it just kind of throws out that phrasing, said that he squandered his estate on loose living. So he, he got the biggie size fries every time he went through McDonald's. He was blowing through money as fast as he could, okay? So the tone has been set. We know the major characters or the major players in this particular lesson. And we know the father has been equal, you could say, at least in apportioning out what's due for each of the sons. Let's go a little further in this then. Of the two prodigals, of the two sons, we tend to throw the idea of the phrasing of prodigal onto the young son. <laughs> but I want to suggest to you today that the older son was also wasteful. 
He was also squandering and probably didn't realize it until later on, if at all. In Luke chapter 15, verses 14 and following, we find the young son packing up all he has, has gone to the distant land, he's squandered his living, and now he's coming to a realization. Verse 14, the Bible says, now when he'd spent everything, and that's a big word, everything, a severe famine occurred in that country and he began to be impoverished. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country. He sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would have gladly filled his stomach with the pods the swine were eating. And no one was giving anything to him. This is a harsh circumstance. He didn't have the forethought to plan ahead in case there were rainy days. He didn't have the fiscal responsibility to save anything back in preparation for that. Instead, he just blew everything. He just went through everything he had. And then the famine came. And it's in the height of this or in the depth of this famine that, that we find really the context for all that's going on. You know, it doesn't matter in terms of how severe something is. When you've lost everything, if you had a huge amount or a small amount, doesn't matter how severe, when you've lost everything, you've lost everything. For the poor man who's lost everything, it's devastating. For the wealthy man who's lost everything, it's devastating. Here's this young man in a foreign place. He doesn't have family. He doesn't have those connections. He's lost everything. And then on top of that, misery on top of his loss, now there's a famine. Now, I can't really relate to the idea of being impoverished to the point that I've not been able to at least be sustained. But there are some who have had to deal with this sort of thing. And around the world, certainly, there are many people groups who are suffering from something like this. It's really not so much any fault of theirs, but there are times when certainly it is a personal irresponsibility that's brought someone to this place. But when you're hungry, you're hungry. doesn't matter. The Bible says this man hired himself out, and the common thing that's taught about this was being in a Jewish environment, coming from a Jewish community in a foreign land now, he's now, because he's hiring himself out and being paid to feed swine, obviously working for someone who's not of Jewish heritage because it would have been unclean for them to have kept swine. He is taking care of the swine, doing something he would have never imagined himself doing before. He was of somewhat of a station, apparently. He had some amount of wealth before. All of that's gone. He has little, if any, dignity left. He's feeding pigs, and he's so hungry, he's thinking to himself, what the pigs are eating looks good. And yet he has nothing to eat. No one's giving him anything. He's longing for what the pigs are eating. Now, perhaps like many of you, I've been in the place where I've helped feed and taken care of animals like that. Never once have I longed for what the animals were eating. Never once. I can't imagine being that hungry. But he was. And no one had regard for him. Can you imagine the sense of regret? Now, I don't know about you, but there have been decisions I've made in my life, and the moment I've made them, I've thought, oh, that may not have been the best thing to do. And you kind of wish you could step back for a moment, take a deep breath, hit the reset, and try it again. But it often doesn't work that way. In those moments, I tend myself to obsess over the options I should have or could have taken that either I ignored or didn't see. Can you imagine how this guy must be feeling? He's left his father and brother behind. He's burned through his estate. He has nothing left. Here he is in this foreign land, taking care of pigs, starving to death, begging, has no opportunity for provision. He probably has some regret. Let's go a little further in the account. Verses 17 and following. 
Scripture says he comes to himself. He says, but he came to his senses and said, How many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread? But I'm dying here with hunger. I'll get up and go to my father and I'll say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired men. How far of a distant land in terms of travel? We don't really know. He's still broke, has no means. At this point, he's not had anything to eat. He's weak. And he's come to himself to the point that he's able to say, you know, I can go work for my dad and at least he'll treat his people fair. He still has to travel from where he is to where his father is. I don't want to diminish that journey because it's necessary. He could have stayed where he was and he perhaps could have sent word to his father, please send somebody to come get me. Send a camel, send a caravan, do whatever you can and I'll just wait here till you come to get me. He didn't do that. He acknowledged the need to go back Boy, I tell you, maybe you can relate to this. When a bad decision is made, something is done, and you regret it, sometimes one of the longest walks you ever take is to go back to the person that's been impacted by that bad decision and say, boy, I really, I really messed this one up. And I need to make it right. What can I do to help make it right? Those conversations are hard. That walk is hard because you're thinking in your mind the whole time, will they receive me? Will they even want to see me? No doubt in his mind, he's probably wondering, will my father even receive me? And yet, as an undertone to all this, is the idea that his father is a fair and just man who will treat even his hired hands well. So he's confident enough that he makes the journey. He's confident enough that he has this idea recognizing what he's done, that he can go back and his needs will be met. In this story, which is really what it is, we see painted out for us so vividly the reality that God desires us to be restored. But it involves our recognition of what we've done and it involves our journey back to Him. If we've wandered, if we've strayed, He's waiting, He's anticipating, He's prepared. He has the means, just as this Father did, to provide well. But He awaits that journey. Let's go a little further then to see what happens. Beginning in verse 20, the Scripture said, He got up, came to His Father. <laughs> Again, we don't know how long of a journey this was. Kind of get the idea it was a while because it was a distant land. Probably took him a while to get there. He doesn't have any means. You know, he, he can't rent a donkey. He's walking, okay? So he's doing the best he can to get there. The Bible says he got up, he came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, and I love the way that's phrased, on the horizon, still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion for him and ran and embraced him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, quickly, bring out the best robe and put it on him. And put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf, kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and has been found. And they began to celebrate. <laughs> Relationships can be really challenging. One of the greatest factors that impairs a relationship is pride. And you know, we can be right about some things. And then that's kind of sometimes compounded by our pride because we know we're right. 
Sometimes that prevents us from reaching out to the person we love just to be able to affirm them and say, I value you and I don't want there to be an issue between us. Over the course of my ministry, even in family, I've seen that sort of pride do tremendous damage. And I read this account and I think, oh my goodness, if I could be like the father. He's been wronged. His son disrespected him. His son took what he had worked for and set back for his kids. And he'd squandered it. He didn't want to know all the details, but he filled in the blanks pretty easily. I'm sure he knew that his son was not living righteously. Now he sees his son perhaps not even hardly recognizable. I mean, the guy's been working with swine. He's going to smell rough. He's not eaten. He's going to be weak. <coughs> but he's looking at the horizon waiting for his son to appear. If I could be like that father... If I could love the son who, who had erred so much that even in the midst of his error, I couldn't wait to help him be restored and be made right. But I'm not often that dad. That's the difference between God and man. You see, God is consistently that father unchanging. There's nothing we do in the foreign land he doesn't already know. There's no wallowing among the pigs that catches him off guard. There is no desire for the pods the pigs are eating that he doesn't feel the pangs of hunger like we do. And yet he waits and he longs and he anticipates our return. The beautiful thing about this then in the awareness of the son, and I want to make sure we get this, the son didn't try to th throw off an excuse. Oh, dad, I got hooked. You know, I, I got scammed. This guy played me for a sucker, and I, I fell for it. And, or I was taken advantage of it. They lied to me. Or, you know, I had this really nice timeshare that didn't work out and I ended up living with pigs. He didn't try to throw off any excuse at all. He blatantly, openly said, I've sinned against you and I've sinned against God. I'm not even worthy to be your son. But if you'll just take me back as a servant, I'll do whatever you ask. Shouldn't that be the response we have when we acknowledge who we are as sinners in need of forgiveness? I mean, we're not bringing anything to the table. There's nothing we can say to excuse what we've done. There's no hiding anything from God. He's already aware of everything. Shouldn't we come with that same sense of humility? I have sinned against you and I have sinned against heaven. I'm not even worthy. Of course it should be. That's the only response. And God's consistent response to that is to take us in. This text, the Bible said, before the young man even completely described what he had done, the father turned to tell his servants, make preparations for the feast. His son was cleaned up. His son had his position, his station restored, sandals on his feet, ring on his hand. He was fully restored as a son. And the best the father had was offered then so that they could celebrate. And the scripture said they all began to celebrate. Now I want to dial it back for just one moment and remind you in Luke chapter 15, those first few verses, remember the two verses and the criticism that was made? The Bible said all of the sinners and tax collectors were coming out to Jesus to hear him speak. And the Pharisees and the scribes were saying, oh, this man, this man keeps company with the sinners. Keep that in mind because now the other wasteful brother comes in. You see, we have one brother who's been with the father all along who wants to go back and rely upon his goodness 
And we have the other brother who has squandered and has been wasteful and wandered off, who's now been restored. Let's see what's happened here. The Scripture paraphrases for us this context. You and I are sinners in need of forgiveness. Secondly, God has already provided. He already has the ability to restore us to Himself. And as we've already seen, celebrate that restoration or that receiving. But what is hinged on is which of the two paths we're going to follow. Our own goodness or the grace of God. Luke 15, verses 25 and following, the older son who was in the field came and approached the house. He heard music and dancing. He summoned one of the servants and began inquiring what these things could be. He said to him, your brother has come. Your father has killed a fattened calf because he's received him back safe and sound. But he became angry and was not willing to go in. And his father came out and began pleading with him. He answered and said to his father, Look, for so many years I've been serving you and I've never neglected a command of yours. And yet you've never given me a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who's devoured your wealth with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. He said to him, Son, you have always been with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice, for this brother of yours was dead and has begun to live. He was lost and has been found. Two brothers. One relying on his own goodness. I've been with you for years. I've worked my guts out. I've never asked you for the first of anything, but that son of yours. See, he wasn't even embracing or acknowledging his brother. That son of yours, you've taken in. He's wasted everything. He's squandered everything. But I've been here laboring and working and serving, and I've never asked for anything. The undertone of all this, look what I've done, and I deserve this. The scribes and the Pharisees had that attitude, Luke 15, 1 and 2. And I'm going to tell you, there have been times I've had the same attitude. Lord, look what I've done. I mean, is it so much to ask for this? I, you know. But under undertone to all this is the realization that we are all in need of forgiveness. First brother squandered. He was wrong. He was sinful. Had he died in the foreign land, had he not been restored, he would have been in horrific peril. Thankfully, there was reason to rejoice. Just as in the New Testament tells us, in the words of Scripture very openly in a couple of points, when someone is restored to Christ, even the angels celebrate. It's important for us to know, had that younger brother died in his unrepentant condition, in his rebellious condition, he would have been in peril. Thankfully, he did not. The journey is important. He came back to God. But equally as sad was a man who was relying upon his own goodness and didn't get it. And God's provision was there the whole time. The father, his provision was there the whole time. And he didn't acknowledge it. He thought he earned it. He thought he deserved it. He thought it was merited. But as we know, the Scripture teaches us that's not how it works in the kingdom of God. Which of them was more wasteful? The one who had offered grace but chose his own righteousness? Or the one, as awful as it sounds, offered the same grace, squandered it, wasted it, and then even eventually coming back to his senses was restored? The reality is we can make that checklist, but every one of us is guilty, whether we've gone to a foreign land or not. Which of the two paths will we follow? Here's the thing. Man's goodness 
whether it's illustrated by a lost sheep, a lost coin, or a wasteful son, man's goodness is never good enough to provide forgiveness. Never. We don't earn it. We don't merit it. We come by the same course, acknowledging we are in need of forgiveness, that Christ is the only answer for that forgiveness. We do what the young son did. We tell God, I've sinned against you, and I've sinned against heaven, and I'm not worthy. And in our submission, our faith, our cooperation, our, our obedience, Scripture teaches us very plainly, God does a work no one else can do. He cleanses us. He puts a robe on us. He puts a ring on our finger. puts sandals on our feet. And He celebrates that we're restored to Him. God's grace is the only thing sufficient to remove sin. And we don't earn it. The Bible tells us it is His gift in response to our obedient faith to Christ. Two sons, same father, two results, two courses to follow. So the question for us would be, which of the two courses will we choose? Our own goodness or the grace of God expressed through the righteousness of Christ? Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for being our Father. We thank you for receiving us to you when we do not deserve to be received. You adopt us into your family, not because of what we've done, but because of what you've done through Christ. When we agree with you and submit to your terms, which are clear and unchanging, you do something no one else can do. We don't earn it. It's not because we're good. As you teach us, we're not. But your grace is sufficient. On this very special day where we consider what it means to be a father and the, the mantle that's worn, the provision and the safety and sense of, of assurance that's there, we're humbled at the reality that you've given us such a wonderful example of what it means to be a father. And in this account, certainly with the two sons, we're cautioned. And we pray that our response would be honorable to you. We pray, Lord, for the forgiveness that can come only through Christ. And that you would help us in the right perspective to see that we are in need of Christ and His forgiveness. And that you'd help us to be fueled on to live a life of even greater service so that we can honor you. Direct us in our actions and help our life to be fitting a son. And we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. <laughs> I'm going to ask if you wouldn't stand with me. We're going to sing a very familiar song, Down at the Cross. Highlights for us the redemptive work of Jesus, which began, paid for, at the cross. And that's important for us. If you have questions about being a Christian, what it means, how you can be assured and confident that you've received forgiveness, the Bible answers those questions for you. And I would love to sit down with you and read with you so that you can have God's answer answers directly. Please, please come talk to me and let's make that happen. Let's sing together down at the cross. <laughs>
So most of us have a desk drawer or maybe a, a drawer in our house uh, that's filled with clutter, a clutter of different objects. And I'm looking around, some of these wives know what, what I'm talking about, these, these clutter boxes that we have. If you dig around in there, you might find pens with no ink in them, stamps perhaps, or even maybe pictures, small pictures, or uh, pictures that you've kept over, over time. But there's also inside those those old drawers. There's there's items that uh, are precious to us. Uh, some of those items we, we call them keepsakes, items which we keep for the sake of another person. It might be uh, an old pocket knife, Dad's old pocket knife, just a reminder of his always being prepared, always prepared to fix something or to cut something or to open something. It causes us to remember him, and we pass that memory on to our children, too. In uh, 1 Corinthians 11, uh, verse 23, uh, the Apostle Paul says in these words, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant of my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. That first uh, sentence there, For I receive from the Lord uh, what I also pass on to you. That's how Paul phrased it. The Lord's Supper is special, first because it was given by our Lord. We do this in remembrance of him. But like those items in our desk drawer, we pass it on to the next generation. And in so doing, we accomplish three things. We connect our past, those who have gone before us, and proclaim our unity with all the church. <laughs> By being faithful uh, in this as we, we stay steadily on course in our lives, being repentant each time. <laughs> And keeping it as we found it, we pass it on, unblemished, to the next generation. We do this only with things we consider important. To you, my dad's knife only has an antique value, but to me it is highly valued. The Lord's Supper, however, is prized by all, by all of us. Done with honest devotion, it's our pro proclamation of the faith. And in doing this, we proclaim his death and thus his atonement. By this, we show our belief in the resurrection and his soon return. As you partake this morning, remember who gave this to you and at what price. Your desk drawer or your drawers at home that contain, they don't contain uh, any keepsake that's as precious as this. Let's pray. Our most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we just come to you this morning giving you thanks. Uh, we just thank you so much for your son and his sacrifice. The, the bread that represents his broken body there on the cross, Lord, and uh, the cup that represents his blood that was shed for our remission of sins. Uh, we just ask that uh, we take these emblems this morning in a manner that's pleasing unto thee. We ask all these things through your precious son, Jesus' name. Amen. stand and we'll have a closing prayer and then we'll sing our closing chorus. Let's pray. 
Our most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for allowing us to gather together uh, in this environment, Lord, that's open and free, and just to look into your word. Uh, we just ask uh, that you be with each and every person that was mentioned during service this morning, and, and those that are on the hearts and minds uh, out in the congregation, Lord, that weren't mentioned. We just uh, lift all those up to you. Uh, we know that you're the great physician, and can, anything's possible through you. Just uh, go with us, guide us, direct us uh, to do your will. We ask all these things through your precious Son, Jesus' name. Amen.